The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. The moon, yeah. That's Hugo, tickling the ivories. He just saved by bundling home and auto with Progressive. Gonna finally buy a ring for that gal of yours, Hugo? Send her my condolences. hi oh This next one's for you, too. There's a burglar in my heart. Thank you. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations. The Fantastic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guests to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. Your journey begins now. Do we understand? What answers are we trying to achieve? Are there answers? Tonight, we gather to find more verity. Join us as we take the journey into the unknown. This is the Fantastic Journey Podcast with your hosts, Gavin Kelly and Paula Purcell. Well, welcome to the Fantastic Journey Podcast, everyone. I'm Gavin Kelly, and sitting right next to me is my lovely wife, Paula Purcell. How are you today, Paula? Doing pretty decent. So far, we've been getting over a sickness this week. Yeah, I'm happy. It, I'm actually almost sound like myself. You oh. were even picking a guitar earlier. I was picking a guitar. I was actually singing earlier, just trying to see if I have a voice anymore. It, I'm sort of rusty and everything. I mean, I've been sick for a month and a half now. Mm. Well, we might be able to get lucky enough to do some Christmas songs come Christmas time. Oh, I, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. Well, I didn't say concert. Nah, well, maybe in the privacy of our own home. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> in the shower when nobody can hear me. I mean, <laughs> that was Silent Night. Oh, wow. So, what do you got in the news for us t- uh, today? I know you got a bunch of weird stuff that you've pulled up, and uh, we ought to check those out before we get our guest on. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me pull it up. I have it under my gallery. I keep all my files on my phone. God okay. help me. I don't lose my phone. If not, we lose my life. Right? Um, hold on. i got to pull it up. What am I holding on to? I don't know. We had a lot of stuff going on this week. Uh, Yeah. If you guys uh, happen to check out my Facebook page and you read my latest post, yeah, we're in, we are actually, um, well, I'll just let you know. This weekend, my crew and I are going back to a location where we are in search of a witch's talisman, hex bags, and symbols written on the wall. This location has been negatively charged, and the entity, or the entities, are highly aggressive now. They have been hurting anyone that comes through the building by scratching, pushing, tripping, and even running up on people and pushing them into the wall or putting them in the corner. We will be joined by another team and a woman that will do a spiritually charged cleansing to rid this location of the darkness. This may be possibly the most frightening and harrowing investigation that we have ever been on, or that we have ever encountered. I was personally attacked 
and it drew blood on me. My camera guy was attacked viciously. There, this may actually seem like it's something from a movie, but believe me, we all wish it was. But this is 100% real. We will be working with spiritual healers, a pagan priest, and a demonologist to help us get an idea of what we are about to encounter and how to battle it. Of course, uh, Joe Vitale says we're going to get our asses handed to us, and I believe that wholeheartedly. But we have to do something to prevent this entity or entities from hurting any more people. It's a chance that we all have to take, and we're going to hope for the best. So wish us luck and Godspeed. We don't know what we're walking into. No, we don't. We've had been told several different things, and I'm, we're just uncertain. I mean, it's just crazy and, and nuts. Of, we've been told it's a dark entity. We've been told it's a demon. We've been told we have been stretched so many different directions on all this that I feel like we're going in there and we're not we're unreceptible to what we are dealing with. It's like we're getting into a, a boxing ring with our box with with our with our gloves on, and mm -hmm. we're going to be fighting what? We don't know what that robed figure is on the other end. We don't know if it's a pissed off, really pissed off spirit that does not want to be there. We don't know if it's something that's being conjured. We don't know if it's, you know, th the scenario is there has been people that have broken into this place and were supposedly witches that were practicing a little black voodoo, magic, or whatever you call it out there in the pagan world. And conjured this, uh, this, 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 uh, this, yeah. And I have learned more in the past 12 hours about this, this scenario and this location. And all these people have come forward to the point. I'm almost in the point of being in tears. Because this is an emotional case. And I know we can't really be emotional on this. Yep. But... I'm asking for all everybody that's listening out there to us, keep us in your prayers. We need a prayer chain to help guide us, help protect us, and help help us, you know. I've been calling on all the guardian angels. I mean, I don't know what else to say, but this is my first time I've ever been frightened into doing an investigation or doing anything to this effect. And I, I mean... Every time I talk about it, my chest, you know, I know my blood pressure is elevating just being talking about because my heart just goes thumps 90 miles an hour. Yeah. I'm just hoping that I don't get clawed in the face again. And Brad, he actually had a feeling of, well, the way he told us, it felt like that something was sucking his life force out of him. And it was kind of like he could actually feel I don't know. It's like something that you would see in a movie. You look like you're actually standing there and then you start feeling yourself kind of withering away and you're trying to grab hold of your soul. But it really frightened the hell out of him. He had to leave the building and go outside and, and calm down. And he said this is something he has never, ever felt before. And I have spoken to a pagan priest, uh, Jarrett. Uh, how do you say his last name? Osborne. Osborne, yeah, Jared Osborne. And he has given me some insight of a lot of things. So at least we have that on our side before we go in. But anyway, let's let's get off of that subject. Paula has some weird news, which I thought she had. I do. It's back up here. Yeah, sure it I, is. I've had people keep messaging me and talking to me all afternoon. So well, I have too. My phone's been blowing up all day. Yeah. Um, today is the anniversary. Oh, come on. Why is it doing this? <laughs> today is the anniversary of something that happened in TV that millions of viewers tune into. Do you know what happened on this day in 1980? If it has nothing to do with Elvis in concert, I have no idea. No. It's TV. I said TV. I said TV. It was TV, too. It was satellite. On TV. Yeah, but this is 1980. I hate to tell this to you, but Elvis is dead by that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. On this day, 
On this day in 1980, 350 million people around the world <coughs> tuned into the television's popular primetime drama, The Jeffersons. Dallas. Oh, dear God. To find out who shot J.R. Ewing. Did anybody <laughs> ever figure out who the hell shot him anyway? Uh, the character's fans love to hate J.R. Has been shot on the season-ending episode the previous March the 21st, which stands as one of the television's most famous cliffhangers. The plot twisted, inspiring... Uh, I forgot where it's at. Uh, inspiring... <laughs> Inspiring, Erica. The plot twisted, inspiring widespread media coverage and left America wondering who shot JR. Hmm. For the next eight months, the November 21st episode showed that the mystery identifying Kristen Shepard, JR's wife's sister, and his former mistress as the culprit. I have a question. What does that have to do with paranormal? You, not, do, you do paranormal news, do, not Dallas. I do what is also history, too. And that was part of our history today. Uh-huh. Was, yeah. Well, I had to throw it in there. I mean, I was a Dallas fan. I don't know how many listeners were Dallas fans. I mean, I was eight, eight, nine years old, glued to the TV set on Friday night with my mother. And it was Dallas and Falcon Crest. <laughs> See, you know the song. Unfortunately, I do. You know, they turned uh, South Fork into a restaurant in Texas. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Well, we're going to Austin. How far is it from there? I have no idea. I'll have to look. We gotta, we're got we going to go meet Jared and Jensen at the uh, family business but brewery that, in Austin. That's what our Friday nights were. were me and Mom, Dallas, and Dad was in the bedroom watching wrestling. So, Well, there you go. Yeah. I'd be doing the same, too. <laughs> On this day, there was a famous birthday. And I, I don't know. Okay. 1945 is when she was born. She's an American actress. Oh, that helps a lot. She has been played in several movies. Uh, once again, helps a lot. She played as Private Benjamin. Ooh. <laughs> Goldie Hawn? Yes, Goldie Hawn. She played I in- win a piece for the <laughs> Trivia Pursuit Pie. <laughs> she played it Overboard with Kurt Russell, who ended up being her... I love lo- that movie. Uh, 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 being her... The lo- remake suck. Lo- her ended up being the love of her life, right. and they never married, but they had been together for almost 35 years now. Oh, wow. But they have never married. Um, also, another debut today. Yeah, there's a lot of debuts. I couldn't pass this up. Okay. 1941. That was when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Mm. This fictional, but that's in December. This fictional character, Canary, also just called made his first appearance in A Tale of Two Kitties, a Warner Brothers... Garfield. A Warner Brothers cartoon. Okay, not Garfield. Nope. There was a movie, Garfield and A Tale of Two Kitties. Yeah, well, this is the early version of Tale of Two Kitties. It's a little mini cartoon. I don't know. And it featured a little canary. Sylvester and Tweety? Tweety. Oh, God. Yeah, Tweety Bird. And, and Sylvester was one of them, but Sylvester had already done his debut a few months I before. I think I got a putty tat. I yeah. did, I did. Fluff and fluff tat. Today is also the National <laughs> Red Mitten Day, National Jukebox Day, National Gingerbread Cookie Day, and Ooh. National Stuffing Day. All right. With us calling it for <laughs> National Stuffing Stuffing day tomorrow is Thanksgiving, so a happy early, happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. And on this day, we celebrate the greatness of stuffing. Many consider it the best part of Thanksgiving dinner. Each year around this time, there's a passionate debate on whether it's called dressing or stuffing. I think it's stuffing. Butterball decided to take a state-by-state survey and found it's totally a regional thing. It depends on where you live is where why they call it. Huh. So, in your neck of the woods, if you're all listening, do they call it stuffing or do they call it dressing? All righty. And that's going to bring us to the person that you are all waiting to listen to. She is... A Kentucky native with a love for history and theater and, of course, the paranormal. She had been able to see ghosts her entire life. This has given her a unique perspective in her life. 
which led to many, many amazing experiences, both good and bad. She has had spirits try to physically harm her, and she has been able to connect people to their lost relatives and help bridge the gap between loved ones. Her abilities have allowed her to experience many, many things to share her story with others. And I am talking about our good friend, Stephanie Bingham. So let's go ahead and get her on the phone here. Where's my mouse? There it is. We'll go ahead and get her on the phone here and uh, we'll learn about uh, her experiences. Hello? Good evening, Stephanie. Hello, Stephanie. Hello. Hi. How, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Uh, finally getting over being sick for about a month and a half. So, That's so fun. Well, yeah. We kept passing it back and forth to each it's other. It's your fault. You keep. Lo- no, it's not my fault. No, not your fault. Her <laughs> fault. It's, it's her fault. She, oh. she breathes on me at I night. I blame her. Well, you breathe on me. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't even face your direction. <laughs> God, it's not my fault. I'm going to side with her. <laughs> oh, well, that sucks. Those girls got to stay together. <laughs> I'm already in a losing battle. What the heck? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, it was really good seeing you at the uh, Scare Fest. And when we sat through your yeah. presentation, that was pretty cool. We enjoyed it. I'm glad you did. So, let's see. You have been able to see spirits your entire life. Go ahead and tell us mm-hmm. about that. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, like, right off the bat, that's damn! <laughs> that's a whole lot. You have to cover there. Okay, start um, from the very beginning. First there were the dinosaurs, and then the earth cooled. No, wrong one. Uh, yes, well, <laughs> that went the other way, but yes. <laughs> Definitely the other way there. But uh, so the first one that I know I actually saw, I was still a toddler. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I was real little at the time. And uh, it was a gentleman with my family, and he would come down from the sky, like through a window. It's always what it looked like to me. It was coming in through the window, and he'd sit and he'd talk to me. And he'd want to talk about just anything and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. But he never really creeped me out. And uh you know, as little kids do, I told my mom about the man who would come in through the window and talk to me at night. Uh-huh. And I'm sure you can guess the reaction to that. Uh, and yeah. She, <laughs> uh-huh, right. So she sort of ascertained that it wasn't really anything <clears throat> physical so much. And so she just sort of patted me on the head and was like, all right, that's, that's nice, okay. And then kind of sent me on my way, and this kept happening over and over again. Until finally one day she found like a big group family picture and she asked me, you know, is the is the man you saw or the man you see, is he in this picture? You know, is he there? And I picked him out, and it was one of my relatives who just recently died. Oh, and wow. I'd never met the man when he was alive. So she knew he was dead, but never bothered to tell me. So I went about my happy little life up well into elementary school, actually, not realizing that what I was seeing was ghosts. Uh-huh. So that's the one that I know I was a ghost that I saw as a child because she knows that it was a ghost. Other than that, I'm not entirely certain. I figured that your mom would have thought that it was an imaginary friend because all children (laughs) at that age, it's an imaginary friend. But theoretically, it actually could be a a spirit of some sort. Absolutely, especially when they know (laughs) things that, you know, the family would know. But imaginary friend would not, you know, just little things like that. Hmm. You ever had anything like that, Paula? No? <laughs> She's over shaking her head like, hmm. So. <laughs> I mean, I've had strange dreams and dreams be on, you know, not really a, of me actually seeing, you know, what I visually experience, but it kind of mm-hmm. makes you wonder Did, and think. Didn't you bring that up when we were at Scarefest to her about that? That you were, ha- you were having, you asked her if she'd ever had that issue or... You're dreaming about a location, but you've never been there? Yeah. I don't know. Did I ask you? Mm-hmm. I've asked that to a couple of other people. I didn't know if I had asked you or not. I don't think you did, Yeah, have, but I absolutely have done that. You have done that to where you have actually dreamed about being at a location that you have never been at. Uh-huh. Yep. 
And some of those places I have been to later, and there are some of them that if I ever see them, I will turn around and run the other way immediately. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Yeah, it's just kind I of I mean, odd. I make no bones about that. If I see some of those places that I've dreamed about, I am leaving immediately. <laughs> I don't care why I'm there. Yeah, Paula actually have started doing that. Um, one of the places is the uh, Thornhaven Manor. And our previous guest was Dalen and Jawan from Ghost Brothers. And mm-hmm. she basically said that she, you woke up and saw this? I woke, it was a three day dream. Three day dream. Yeah. Reoccurring? Had, reoccurring. Well, it reoccurring, mm-hmm. but each night would fill in a little bit more than what the night had a before. A paranormal soap opera? Kind of, sort of, but it did a repeat of exactly what I had, but it threw in an extra detail that wasn't in there from the Previously night in the dream last night. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, every location I've ever dreamed about and saw later has also been a reoccurring dream, or more likely than not a nightmare. But every single. But time, isn't that so. kind of cool and also weird at the same time? I mean, how is it you're actually? I mean, did you ever see this location at any time? Like maybe on TV or in a paper? I mean, all of a sudden you just boom dream about this place that you've never seen before. Mm-hmm. That's just yep. That just blows my mind how you can actually do something like that. It's just crazy. But she did it. And explain to Thornhaven Manor. Well, I think there's a backstory there that has not been told. And that's what mm-hmm. feels like that's stuck in my brain. I've not actually, you know, dug into the story because I have cases that I'm working on now on all, uh, on all different matters. Oh, yeah. But... I think there's a backstory that has not been told there, and but what I have seen in the dream was a little different than what the story was told about it, and it makes me question if, you know, the story that's being told about the haunted situations and everything that's going on at Thornhaven Manor, if there is an underlining story that's not being told that no one knows about, that someone needs to go in there and tell their story or investigate the reason why that has been to me and the deal is I've had actual teams tell me that they have experienced what I have dreamed there and it doesn't go along with what the story was told about the place Mm -hmm. so when you actually have a dream of a location um, is it horrific or is it like sort of educational like something wants you to learn more about it it's never been a learn more about it. Sometimes it is a, there's very rarely people in my dreams when I dream of a location, mm-hmm. but sometimes it feels like the place itself is trying to draw me there. Okay. Like a pool, like it's literally trying to get me there. It's a feel, it's something about the air, it's something about the place, it's almost intoxicating. But other times in the dreams, It is literally a sense of panic. Like, as soon as it starts, before you can actually see what's going on in the dream, Hmm. it is panic immediately. Hmm. And it's the places like that that if I ever see, I will go nowhere near. There is something that wishes me ill there. There's nothing good there. But have you ever wondered why it's actually wanting you to go there? Oh! I considered it. I mean, there's lots of reasons why something might try and draw you in. I mean, for the very least, I mean, it's food for them to feed off of, you know, the fear, the anxiety, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. Um, The places that aren't quite so malicious, I almost think that there isn't necessarily the place, but there's something there that might want to talk and can't get out from the location to talk. You know what I mean? Or it wants to attach to you so it can get out. Yeah, well, that really doesn't. You know, that doesn't faze me all that much. I'm going to attach you, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, as long as we're not getting violent about it, let's talk. <laughs> so, on that subject, have you ever had an attachment? Not an attachment in the traditional sense, no. I've never had a ghost actually glom onto me and be like, I am attached to you now. That's just weird. I mean, um, <laughs> it's just not something that happens around me very often. Uh-huh. I mean, I've had ghosts, certain ones have been around since I was a child. Um, but they're not attachments necessarily. They're people that I've known. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like they are, they're just people in my mind almost. Um, 
And I've had very, very, very violent interactions with spirits before, but I've never had anything successfully try and come up and attach to me. Okay. Ever. Now, when you're you know, saying... Things, things have tried to possess me before. Oh, wow. But even that, not a true attachment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, at one possession of the body, nothing else. Now, when you said violent attacks, as in what? As uh, getting scratched, kicked, or any of those? I've been scratched, I've been kicked, I've been bitten, I was pushed down a flight of stairs by an inhuman spirit. Mm. Um, I've had scissors thrown at me. I mean, there's been a lot of violent stuff that I've been around. I mean, I've seemed very good at finding the uh, ones that really <laughs> like to try and lash out. Right. But in every case, with the exception of the one that pushed me down the stairs, it was mild. Mm. I mean, even if they bit me, it stung, but it wasn't anything... You know, nothing ever broke the skin, nothing ever crazy like that. They threw something at me, it fell short of me, you know. The only one that succeeded in getting close to actual physical harm was the one who pushed me down the stairs. Wow. It is just truly amazing that an unseen force can have that much power or that much energy to do something like that. I mean, ever since... We... To be fair, she was a not normal case at all. Oh, okay. Um... Inhuman? Not normal. Yeah, she was inhuman. She was not a human. She'd never been a human and never will be. Okay. Um, essentially, what happened in her case was I had a roommate whose mother went on a mission trip to the Caribbean, Oops. ministered no. to a group who did not want to be ministered to, and then took a gift from them. Oh. The gift was a string of beads, and she brought them back to her house, and then suddenly she started hearing like laughter and little steps running through her house and got really, really creeped out. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't good. So my college roommate decided that her best option to save her mother from whatever she brought home with her was to take those beads, bring them from her house, and put them under my bed in the dorm without telling me that they were there. Oh, nice. So, nice. <laughs> I know, right? I'm so very considerate. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she put the beads there, and then almost immediately thereafter, I start getting friends, like three and four different girls that I know on campus coming up to me, telling me about these weird dreams they were having. And they were all basically the same. They were all either lying in a bed or in a bathtub, and there was a little girl at the foot of the bed or the foot of the bathtub smiling at them, and they were terrified. And that's all they could really tell me. They couldn't tell me why they were scared or why they were telling me this dream. Right. But they all had this weird thing with this little girl looking at them, and it was creepy. And the first couple times I heard them, like, oh, well, they probably watched a movie or something. Second mm -hmm. or third and fourth time, I was like, well, uh, maybe something's going on here. Yep. yep. So within about four days of the bees being put under my bed, it was the weekend, and I decided to do laundry. And, of course, we were in the dorms. And it was a Saturday, and it was Eastern, so there was nobody in the dorm. And it's the oldest dorm on campus mm -hmm. that had been used as a Civil War hospital, so you know it's nice and creepy to begin with. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so I had my laundry basket going down an abandoned flight of stairs into an abandoned basement oh, where geez. the laundry room is at, you know, isolated as can be. And dark. <laughs> and, but, well, it was daytime, so it wasn't super dark, but there were no lights in the hallway, just the lights from outside. So, right. you know, it wasn't... Super bad, just super isolating. So I started to go down the stairs, and you know that feeling when something manifests? Mm -hmm. How the air changes? Oh, yeah. It gets thick. I got that. It gets thick where you yeah, can't so breathe. Yeah, that's static. Mm -hmm. And so it was that, and I knew something was there, but I knew it was behind me. But most of the time when a ghost manifests, I don't look at them because I don't want to engage with them. Right. When they know I'm looking at them, they start talking to me, and that just gets annoying really, really quickly. So I was doing my normal I'm not going to talk to you thing, and the next thing I know, I felt little hands, like very distinctly like six-year-old child size hands uh -huh. on the back of my leg, and it pushed forward. Oh. So I drop my laundry basket, it falls down the stairs, I fall about halfway down the stairs before I can finally grab onto the banister, mm -hmm. you know, to try and not die. Right. So I grab the banister, and I sort of try and stand up and look behind me, and there at the top of the stairs is the little girl, and she was adorable. She was super cute. 
dark hair, dark eyes, like this little rose colored, really flimsy nightgown on, bare feet. And she was smiling at me. She was super excited. Huh. And then I realized why my friends that would tell me about these dreams were so freaked out by her. Her teeth, when she was smiling, were not teeth. They were like a shark's. They were straight up and down, and they were pointed down to like little daggers. What? Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't good. Like, a, and, like uh, vampires or a reptilian. Almost, yes, yes. Not so much like pointed like triangles, but like daggers. Like they were super sharp, and they were all of her teeth, top and bottom. And she was just smiling, giving me a good glimpse of all those teeth. And unfortunately for me, in most cases, my reaction to something coming at me like that is to be aggressive back at it. Uh-oh. So before I really thought about what I was doing, I decided I was going to catch her. I was going to run up those stairs and I was going to grab her. No idea what I planned on doing once I got her, <laughs> but that's what I did. I ran up the stairs. Luckily for me, by the time I got there, she was gone. And it was about that time my brain sort of caught up with me and realized what I just saw. Mm-hmm. That is the only thing, same thing I could do. I ran back to my dorm room where my roommate was and was like, what did I just see? And she's like, oh, I put these beads under your bed. Think that has anything to do with it? And I was like, are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> wow. I kind oh, of, yeah. I, you know, fun right, times. Right when you're sitting there telling me, it's like, well, well I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to catch her. You know, the first thing that popped up in my head is Ray Stant saying, all right, guys, stay close. Stay close. All right, guys, get her! Basically. <laughs> and you go, Basically. Rah! <laughs> you know. Oh, man, I'm sorry. If I see something with sharp daggers for teeth, um, I think I probably would have threw something at it. Well, I was on the stairs, and I'd already dropped my basket, so I had me. Yeah. I didn't even have my cell phone on me at the time. Well, at least you got to see what pushed you. We were at the Massac yes. County Courthouse, and we were live. I was on Facebook Live. She was on Facebook Live. And I also was carrying a $4,000 camera. And <laughs> I'm going down the stairs, and just like right when I got toward the very top and I was about to go down, you can watch on a Facebook Live, you see me go down at an angle. I got pushed from the top of the stairs down, and I had to, like, slam myself into the wall and grab hold of mm-hmm. the railing to stop me from going all the way down. And, mm-hmm. and, of course, the camera was okay, but I was a little banged up. <laughs> the camera's important, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I turned around, and she goes, what happened? I said, I got pushed. And, you know, only one behind me was her. <laughs> <laughs> But see, it was all building on up because we were in the jail up on the third floor. The third yes. floor. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Lori Johnson was in our feed, and she said, um, "Beware, something's gonna mm-hmm. happen." I mm-hmm. hate when someone tells me that, but nothing happened right away. She said, "It's not gonna happen right away, but it's going to happen." And then uh, all of a sudden. She told me to be careful. And next thing you know, I get pushed down the stairs. I'm like, damn, what the hell? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It happens. Oh, yeah. That's some crazy stuff. So, we've already gotten to the chilling and scary stuff. So, how about we talk about some uh, amazing experiences that you've had in the paranormal? Amazing in what way? As in something that would be memorable to you, that it sticks out in your mind, something that, oh gosh, how do I put it? You you came up with it last week, remember? You said oh, it to Dalen? Oh, it's, it's basically one of those that whenever someone asks you about a paranormal experience, it's the first thing that pops out of your head. Pops in your mind. Or pops into your mind. I don't think it's going to pop out of her head. Well, That'd be a little I weird. hope not. <laughs> That'd be a little weird. <laughs> Oh, there goes weird. an idea. That'd be a lot weird. Uh huh. Tell me about it. Well, I I think one of the stories that is always sort of close in my mind um, happened when I was very, very young, or started happening when I was very, very young. Um, there were kids in my neighborhood, like several kids, 
but I had two little kids in particular that didn't necessarily live in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. and would sort of kind of show up inside my house. (laughs) Uninvited and unannounced. You know, you know, exactly. And I was little enough at the time that I didn't really think about it and it didn't really sort of register in my head that that was at all odd. But it was a little girl and her brother Mm -hmm. and they were some of my best playmates. They were like my best friends. But I thought it was kind of weird because the little brother would never speak. The little girl would talk to me all the time, but the boy, he just didn't talk at all. And I didn't really realize that the kids weren't alive anymore. But as... hmm? I was saying, oh, and I'm thinking, did they have black (laughs) eyes? They did not. They did not. No, these were completely normal small children. There was nothing odd about them. Um... But I started noticing that there was not only the kids that would sort of skulk around, but occasionally there was a man, a much older, nearly elderly man, okay. who was very creepy. I, I never liked him. He was always just sort of strange and odd and off-putting and just ugh, gave me the creeps. You know, I didn't like him. And every time he would show up, the kids would disappear. Like, they could be there the moment before. As soon as he showed up, they were gone. Mm-hmm. And... It took me a while to sort of figure it out, but eventually I got it out of the little girl. He was their grandfather, and he'd killed them. He'd killed both of them, and they were afraid of him. They were very afraid of him, but they didn't like the idea that he was hanging out around the other children. So they were trying the best that they could to sort of insulate us from him, if that makes any sense. Um very sweet kids and he was super aggressive he was he was awful when i was little he used to walk down the hallway of our house with like these it sounded like big heavy boots oh wow just yeah slowly down the hallway and it sounded like it would take hours to get there and he would just stand in my doorway and just sort of try and menace just big and creepy and grr, mm. you know um tall guy but when you're you know three feet tall everyone's tall you know oh yeah yeah he was wearing a white shirt, and he had suspenders, and his legs didn't really go all the way down. And again, I should have realized that he probably wasn't alive, but it didn't quite click in my head that this wasn't all normal. Right. Um, so it took me quite a long time to figure out how to deal with him. But by the time I'd figured out how to get him to stop, I'd realized the other girl, the other girl and boy were ghosts. And... At that point in time, I had just enough understanding to sort of talk to them about it. You know, you don't have to stay. I can take care of him. You guys can go. Right. You know. And to some extent, they did. But they still pop in occasionally. And it's just the two of them. It's just like they're trying to hop in and say hi. Okay. But they're not there nearly as often. And they just, it was like they were freed after that. Like, they had the option of leaving. They didn't have to stay there and try and protect anyone else from the creeper. Mm-hmm. because it was done. So I guess that one has always sort of made me, you know, warm and fuzzy. They were my friends, and I was able to help them in some sort of, in my mind, substantial way, you know? Okay. Now, I, I'm thinking from listening to, you know, that the story, were these spirits solid? Yes. I didn't even think that was a real thing, that they could actually be solid. I mean, how on earth can a spirit actually have that much energy to manifest and be solid? How old were you? That started when I was three, four, five. Three or four or five. Well, see, it still is a child. And I I mean, spirits can be to the point of being solid. I've heard stories of it. But for a child at that age, they... Their, 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 how do I put it? Their sensory levels is more astounding at that age when they see something more 3D effect than what we can. Just like so, if it's translucent, so if it's translucent, it actually looks like a cartoon, and I think it's solid. Yes. Oh. Well, to be fair, they looked like people to me. And I mean, even since then, I was in New Orleans when I was in high school age, I want to say. Mm-hmm. 
And there was a little girl at the hotel we were staying out, and she wanted me to walk her across the lobby. It was a very busy lobby over to the restaurant mm-hmm. that was sitting over there, and she wanted to walk across alone. And she was little enough that I didn't think anything of it. Took her hand, walked her across. By the time I got to the line where the little maitre d' guy was waiting to see people, mm-hmm. the little girl was gone. The one who had just been holding my hand was completely gone. I looked up at the guy, and he's like, oh, don't worry. It happens all the time. So I was like, Okay. And that is when I decided that I no longer talk to people. Other people don't talk to first in public. <laughs> were they actually, did they actually have skin color? I mean, they were not yeah. tinted or anything? Actual skin no. pigment color and everything? Yeah, they look like people. Good Lord. I'm waiting to actually That's see a I solid mean by one. I see dead people. I would, they look like people to me. And it was very, very complicated when I was younger. Especially when I didn't know that they were dead. Okay. Have you ever had any of them come to you and ask for help to cross over? No. Well, that's weird. Why wouldn't they? Well, I mean, <laughs> there is some that doesn't understand what's going on with them, and they've actually come to people, and and people has helped them that has actually visually seen them. I would figure mm-hmm. that if they are solid, they don't know that they're dead. True, but you never know, you know... The open-ended question to that. The Sixth Sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. That, Very much so. That movie, I still, to this day, did did not know Bruce Willis was dead. <laughs> I watched that movie like three times, and a friend of mine told me, he's like, you know Bruce Willis is dead, right? I'm like, no, he's not. It's like, he got shot. I'm like... Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that was yeah, nicely I had a funny done. Yeah, deja vu watching that movie the first time I saw it. You know, just looks a little too close to home to me. Yeah, because now you're saying, I see dead people. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like I told Paula, I said, I wish I had that gift. I mean, I'm not <laughs> wanting to be cursed or anything, but I would love to have that gift because that way... We go into a location. I know exactly what direction to go to talk. Because can you imagine? Here we are. We're doing an EVP session, and it's like behind us going, <coughs> I'm standing behind them. It, I mean, seriously. We think we're talking mm-hmm. to someone in front of us, but it's actually behind us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it would be awesome. But I think the other side of that coin is a lot of them that are specifically trying to scare people and get that reaction out of them. Yeah. As soon as they realize that you can actually see them, they try and hide because, oh no, what if it tells? <laughs> and it becomes highly annoying to me. I don't like tracking these things down. If I'm out somewhere as part of an investigation, I'm going to get in, get out, and be done. There's no need to do all this little extra stuff. Don't run and hide from me. If you want something, come tell me. Otherwise, go away and leave people alone. You yeah. know. Well, I mean... It would be kind of cool to actually have the gift to... Now, I'm going to use a TV idea on this one. You walk into the murder house in uh, American Horror Story, and you can see everybody there. They're, and they're just mm-hmm. doing their normal things. Like, they're not dead. They're They're there. They're walking. They're doing dishes. They're talking painting and all that. I mean, that would be truly awesome to see. And then, you know, believe it or not, I would actually probably try to converse with a lot of them and just, you know, start talking, just put a recorder on and (laughs) get this stuff recorded. I mean, of course, the camera's not going to see it, but I will. Mm -hmm. And that'll be awesome. Yeah, we can always dream. (laughs) (laughs) But you have that gift. I do, I do. And I think if you're born with it, it is very, very nice. But I can't imagine having the way I see things thrust on someone who is an adult. Mm -hmm. I don't see that going well. Yeah, it it makes sense. (laughs) You know, it's a little paradigm shifting. You wanted to ask her something about those... uh stories that she was doing when we were at yeah, Scarefest. Yeah, I was wanting you to repeat a story so I could understand it better because I was trying to re-say it to uh, our camera guy about the story about the fairies. 
that were the fairies. Yeah, the fairies or the ones that are in Ohio, I think. Or? The one where the guy was following them. Next thing you know, he ends up he's in a river. Oh, the lights. Yeah, so, the lights. The fairies. Uh, I call them fairies, but you call them lights. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that story was actually from Louisiana. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, it's called a fifile. Um A fifile is essentially a ghost light. You'll find them. I've heard of them in Ohio, but I've also heard the story you're talking about in particular uh, was told to me from someone down in Louisiana. Um, so basically what had happened in that particular instance was there was a picnic, and one of the gentlemen had wandered off from said picnic and for whatever reason decided to start following a little light. And ended up following this thing through the woods and ended up in a lake <laughs> before he realized what he was doing. And there's actually a very long history of that exact scenario happening um, in Louisiana and I've heard in Ohio and especially over in Ireland and Scotland and places like that over there at the Little Lewis. But almost in all cases, the thing that draws you away is there to either be mischievous or to kill you. One of the two. It's never said to be like this sort of sweet and happy and, you know, you don't follow the floating lights. And uh, the lights a lot of times are known to draw people who are lost or their car is broken down or they're sitting out at a picnic, you know. It's been used as an explanation for why sometimes children would go missing. They would follow the light into the wood. And they'd never be seen again, or their body would be found floating in a marsh or a swamp or some other shallow, icky, bother water, you know. Right. Um, it's sort of the same kind of thing as the uh, the Kushtaka up in uh, Alaska, actually. But that one, sometimes you'll see a light, but more often in the Alaskan story, you're going to end up hearing generally your grandmother calling your name from just out of sight at the edge of the woods. And right. the kids would go off to find them, and they would never be seen again. Um, I've heard, it's a I've very, heard that very one. Very common story. Yeah, I've heard that one. And before. very often, yeah, very often denoted to fairies if it is overseas, or a fifile if it's here, or, or a witch. other just sort of native creepy crawlies. Yeah, or or a witch that actually or a witch, mimics your yeah. family member to lure you out. Hmm. Yep. Well, there you go. Fairies. <laughs> well. Fairies that they're in overseas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty lights. Oh, light. Yeah, don't follow the lights. No. And if you do happen to find yourself following a light, one of the uh, sort of old-fashioned remedies for that was to turn your jacket or your shirt inside out. And it's kind of the same idea there as if you walk out of a cemetery, you're supposed to walk out backwards. So that you confuse the thing that is trying to lure you or follow you so that you can get away from them. You ever heard of that? No, I haven't. We always walk forward out of a cemetery. <laughs> if you think something is following you, you're supposed to walk out backwards. Oh, hell no. We run out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an option, too. Run out backwards next time. Try that. <laughs> Oh. Or, or, you, or you get the local law enforcement says, what are you doing? Oh, God. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, we were we were at a, a cemetery, St. John uh, Church, right across the street is a German cemetery. And oh. we're up there, we got our cameras and stuff, and all of a sudden there's a guy shows up down below, and he's like, hey! And I'm like, what? What are you doing? Uh, investigating? And he goes, investigating what? <laughs> uh, dead people? All right, get down here. <laughs> it was a cop. And uh-huh. we went on down there and explained everything, who we are, what we're doing. We had ID badges and everything. He goes, I am not calling this in. <laughs> but he said people saw us up there and they and they thought we had shovels and stuff. I'm like, really? A uh, camera? Oh, you're digging up dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Makes so much sense. But yeah, that that was that weird. That was awesome. Yeah, it, it was awesome. And the funny part of it is, we had the recorder going, so we had recorded yep. that whole conversation <laughs> of the call. That, that, was awesome. that whole conversation is awesome. Oh, that was awesome. I bet. Oh my god. So, you were about to say something else? 
Uh, well, um, what got you into, I know we got to listen to you at Scarefest, but what got you into uh, finding the, the stories that you do about, you know, uh, the one about the tree. And that looks like a woman's head. That looks like a woman's head. Yep. And what Mandy intrigued tree? you into getting into looking into these, these uh, I call them wilderness haunting stories, but what got you into looking into that area of finding the histories and the stories of uh, of the folk tales urban and, urban legends or urban legends yeah that's the word i'm looking for some from urban legends uh so it's sort of two prong uh when i was very little especially the mandy tree my parents and my grandparents would tell me about the mandy tree they'd seen it like they had been there the tree was there it looked like the person you know it was a thing mm-hmm. um the story that grew up around it neither here nor there on truth on that but there was a tree that looked like a lady and there'd been a murder. These two things we all know. Mm -hmm. Or a suicide, if you look at the official reports. But when I'd finally sort of realized that I saw things and that that wasn't normal, I needed to sort of normalize it to myself. Mm -hmm. So as I started going through school and just, I was always a very voracious reader and always read well above level. And so as I was going through school, I would literally read anything I could get my paws on that had anything to do with the paranormal or the occult or witchcraft or ghosts and vampires, anything that was a little bit off mm-hmm. and might have some morsel of truth. I mean, I read the Malleus Maleficarum for the first time when I was in high school. I mean, that's not normal high school reading, but it's just trying to get my, my, my brain around it, trying to make it make sense to me. So when I finally went to college, I found the perfect opportunity. I liked history, and I wanted to find somebody else who had seen what I'd seen and mm-hmm. somebody else that was like me, essentially. So I decided I was going to study the paranormal in college. My professor told me that I couldn't, and I said, watch me. And that is exactly what I did. And so in undergrad, I looked specifically at ancient Egyptian religions and voodoo and sort of the intersection between the two of them. Right. And then in grad school, I looked at spiritualism and how essentially the spiritualist movement and voodoo at the turn of the last century sort of worked in tandem to allow these very talented psychics, essentially, ways to express themselves and escape cultural norms and standards for women and people of color and all sorts of other things by simply using what they could do and not hiding it. Right. So it was essentially me wanting to prove to myself that I wasn't crazy Mm -hmm. and uh, just making sure that it wasn't just me that had this sort of experience. Some of those things are very hard to find in, in a library or even online, you know, to this day. Uh, I found out a few things that I did not know about, and I tried to look them up, and hell, I can't find them online, but two things I've learned about is one called a sentinel, and Mm -hmm. if you see it, it gives off a red, high high energy of red. It kind of looks like a Mm will-o'-wisp, and of course, we all know that's due to a camera shutter problem, but supposedly... It could be a sentinel, and of course, if that shows up, then death is right behind it. And I learned about a vanguard that has three eyes, and it likes to take human hosts. It's just crazy thing that you would actually, (laughs) watching the TV show, the CW Supernatural, and it's actually real. The Supernatural TV show, at least a few seasons ago, was exceedingly well-researched. Oh, yeah. Exceedingly well-researched. It it is. Some of the books they use for research, I know some people that wrote them, and you're just like, really? Really? You're you're doing, okay, sure, why not? Make that reference. Cool. Yeah. It's not weird at all. I mean, but it's just, these writers are, are coming up with this stuff that's actually real. I mean, I actually started watching the show, Paula got me into it, and, um, I started researching the sigils, the sigils, and I'm like, holy crap, mm-hmm. they're real. Well, I mean, two of them are kind of wrong. The purgatory one is well, wrong, and so is the, uh, the demon trap is wrong. 
They just kind of took do, characters out. They do, and they out. mix symbols from that, from different forms of demons and different types mm-hmm. of demonology and even different countries. I yeah. mean, but there's bits and pieces of truth in all of them, it seems. Mm-hmm. Like, they're all based on something. Oh, I know. So that's why I was just like, I'm going to have to go ahead and go through a couple episodes and find the one about a sentinel and find one about a vanguard. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. obviously it's real. I mean, I've, I've been learning about... Uh, two major entities and one is Lilith the creator mm-hmm. and she is also the creator of Asmodeus and we, we've we've been some stories oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah and we're kind of involved in a <laughs> circle of this um okay it's hard to explain, but it involves a lot of people. We've all been branded with it, if if you would say. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we we were at uh, the industrial slaughterhouse in Fancy Farm, and I pulled up the ovulus, and it said, "Get Jesus 7. And Probably not a good sign. <clears throat> no. <laughs> and then right after that, I had to, Brad was asking me, he's like, what is what is that? So I was explaining it to him, and the next thing you know, he's standing against the wall holding the camera, and he's like, he's making the weird face, and he's like, oh, whoa, whoa. Dude, I, I got to go. I got to get out of here. He told me while he was standing there, it felt like something reached into his back and started pulling his life force through his, out of him. Yeah, yeah, some of them do that. And he had to leave the building and go outside. And we come to yeah, find. Yeah, we found him almost laying on the ground outside. Yeah, because he was he it was, was bad. totally drained, and he said he saw his life flashing before him, and it was just, oh my God, it's just crazy. And we come to find mm-hmm. out that there's a grim inside this location. But there's also other things in there. Uh, we believe there's a sentinel in there as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, we're going there this weekend because we're going to go try to find a witch's talisman, hex bags, and there's also symbols that are up on the walls that we have to find. You should send me a picture of the symbols. I might be able to help you. Okay. You most certainly will. Because I don't know any of this stuff. I try to research some of the stuff. I, so I was dealing with a situation sort of kind of like this mm-hmm. when I was in high school. Because okay. high school is a fun time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Buffy the Vampire uh, Slayer. Somebody, basically, yeah. That was <laughs> kind of my life. Um, somebody had essentially gone to our dance studio, which was out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, wow. And then had drawn a sigil behind one of the walls that was then covered in mirrors. Okay. So are you familiar with the mirrors and the portals and things of that nature? So by putting it there really made it kind of, you know, annoying. Uh Uh-huh. At least from my end, very annoying. And uh, so I started getting calls from some of the guys that were in the dance uh, classes with me. They were seeing things like they'd be there late at night doing rehearsals and karate classes and things like that. And they would call me because they heard strange things in the big dance room where that had happened Mm -hmm. and they had seen things. And I remember getting one call in particular was panicked. He was super nervous and he had seen a horse thing in his words, a horse thing coming through the mirror. Oh, wow. And he's like, what do I do? And I'm like, if you see a horse thing coming out of the mirror, you leave. <laughs> well, like, yeah. Nah. Or break the <laughs> yeah, mirror. You, know, you get out. You can break the mirror. Uh, well, the problem with breaking a mirror like that, if it's got something attached to it, if you break it, you give them a dozen portals as opposed to a single portal. Oh. Breaking a mirror does not cleanse a mirror. There are ways to do that. But if you do it there, it's a wall of mirrors. Uh. Suddenly we have seven other mirrors. And there's mirrors in the very next room that face it because of mirrors that are facing one another right. and bouncing between and to the side. So it literally, the entire place was infested. It was gross. Oh, jeez. Um, and by the time I got out there, it was raining. And so by the time I went to the back of the building to see what was written, trying mm-hmm. to figure out why there was a horse thing crawling through the mirror, 
um, all that was left is sort of a smeared, dripping chalk sigil on the back of the wall. So try and piece together what had been summoned while not having a sigil to look at, you know, in a small town in Kentucky where there's no resources and mm-hmm. you just kind of have to play this by ear. Yeah, the only problem... And that critter ended up following me for the next two years. Oh, wow. <laughs> I am hoping, because since this place has been used every year as a haunted attraction, they mm-hmm. constantly tear down and rebuild inside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My issue is, if there's symbols on a wall, what happens if the freaking thing has another wall in front of it? How are we going to find it? You won't. I mean, that's the only answer there. And if you're looking for a true hex bag or a talisman, anything like that, those can literally be made out of anything. Mm -hmm. Some traditions are very strict about what they have to be made with, Mm -hmm. but you can make a talisman out of anything you want it to be made out of. It just takes the intent, the will, and the know-how. Right. I mean, you could hide it in plain sight. However, so, a EMF detector luck. can actually detect it, from what I, my it understanding. It can if it's made certain ways. Hmm. I mean, I can think of ways that you could go around that if you really wanted to, but that is a lot of forethought. Right, right. You know? Well, these are young witches that actually did something to the slaughterhouse. They came in, they conjured something up. And it's been there, and it's been ramping up. I mean, it has actually hurt a lot of people inside this uh, building. Uh, One person got hurt so bad that she had to be hospitalized and then ended up in a mental institution. Mm -hmm. Um, People have been getting bit, scratched. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the girls that we interviewed... She was there taking a few people through, and she felt something run up on her and actually shove her into a dark corner. Mm-hmm. And she's just totally terrified. I mean, it's getting highly aggressive, and that's the reason why we're going in with a team. We're going in with a cleanser. Um, it, this is going to be like a major spiritual warfare here, and we're taking cameras mm-hmm. to get it all on video. Yeah. Because no one's going to believe us unless we have proof. They still won't believe you. Well, if it's on video. I mean, (laughs) people can find holes in anything. Oh, yeah, of course. All right. Well, we are currently at our half mark, so we're going to have to take uh, a few moments here for a commercial break. And then uh, we will come right back. And then we can talk about, let's see. I'm sure Paula's got some other stuff. She's over here. And we've got to put five minutes in about... About what? Furbaka. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> the Furbaka. Yeah, we got to give him five minutes of fame. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. You guys are listening to the Phantasma Journey podcast with our special guest, Stephanie Bingham. And uh, we will be right back. Where is my button? There it is. We've been having some weird issues with this system due to the storms and everything, so this is kind of weird. I don't know what's going on here, but I get it figured out right about uh, now. found anywhere, but the best place to start is in the forest. It's the most powerful magic there is. Head outside to discover incredible animals Wow! and beautiful plants that come together to create an unforgettable adventure. <laughs> so grab your loved ones and explore a world of possibilities. Visit discovertheforest.org to find the closest forest or park to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. My teacher said that we should have a plan in case of an emergency. Do we have one? First thing I'm going to do is grab a flashlight with dead batteries. I'm going to start randomly throwing clothes in the bag. You two will be hiding in the closet and Dad won't be able to find you. And that's when we both start crying. Uncontrollably. Can you pass the cutlets? 
winging it is not an emergency plan. Make sure your kids know what to do during an emergency, who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Search ReadyKids at NYC.gov or call 311. Brought to you by the New York City Office of Emergency Management and the Ad Council. Keyboard Cat, Hamilton the Pug, and Toast Meets World. These are some of the Internet's most beloved pets. And they all have one thing in common. Their stories started in a shelter. Start your story. Adopt a dog or cat today. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Training that pet to play the keyboard, that's optional. Start a story. Adopt a shelter or rescue pet today. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Okay, what are you wearing right now? Nothing. That's right. So mommy's going to teach you how to dress yourself. Underwear always comes first. Name tag at the back, then pants, then shirt. Get the first button in the right hole or you have to start all over. Socks going first, then shoes right on right, left on left. With shoelaces, just take the ends, cross them over, switch the loops. The rabbit goes down the hole, pull tight, and you left with bunny ears. Got it? Why are your pants on your head? Most parenting is hard to do in just two minutes. But two minutes twice a day, making sure they brush their teeth is easier, and it could help save them from a lifetime of tooth pain. Visit 2 min 2 xorg to find out more. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives, and the Ag Council. How's it going? I'm having a stroke. Are you going to shake my hand? I'm having a stroke. Wow, you're not even moving your arm. I'm having a stroke. When someone is having a stroke, they may not be able to say it with words, but their body language will tell you loud and clear. Look for FAST. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911 immediately. Know the sudden signs. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. The stores are bringing me a baby brother. We can do this together. All right, let's go. Storks know how to keep kids safe. Do you? What? Oh, my gosh, you don't know. <gasps> I know. You don't. <laughs> oh, man, you laugh when you're uncomfortable. <laughs> no. Making sure your child is in the right car seat is one of the steps to safer travel. I will rock this. You will rock this. To know for sure that your child is in the right car seat for their age and size, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. Cool, cool, cool. Very cool, very cool. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad hey, Let me ask you something. Would you seat your three-year-old child on a windowsill? Would you seat them beside a lit fireplace or by the deep end of a pool? One last question. Would you seat your child in a car seat that's not correct for them? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Secure their future. Seat them in the correct car seat. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. Take one. Behold the angry giant. Try it again, Alberto. Behold the angry giant. Perfect. Good luck tonight. Behold the angry giant. Yay! Read me another one, Dad. This is WWE superstar Alberto Del Rio. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. The Fantastic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guest to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. All right, well, welcome back to the Phantasmic Journey podcast, and our guest tonight... She is a Kentucky native with a love for history and theater and, of course, the paranormal. 
She'd been able to see ghosts her entire life. This had given her a unique perspective in her life, which led to many, many amazing, both good and bad experiences. She'd had spirits try to physically harm her, and she'd been able to connect people with their lost relatives and help bridge the gap between the loved ones. Her ability had allowed her to experience many things and to share her stories with others. I'm talking about our good friend, Stephanie Bingham. Welcome back, Stephanie. Thank you. Pretty good uh, intro there, huh? Absolutely. Uh, you... Best I've heard today. <laughs> uh, you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to. I know, right? <laughs> so, speaking about connecting people with their lost relatives and helping bridge the gap between loved ones, can you kind of elaborate on that for us? So, it's not something that I do often. Um, I generally prefer if I'm going to work with something, it's either going to be with a child that has talents and quirks sort of like I did at that age, Mm -hmm. or it's going to be the inhuman spirits that most people don't really know how to deal with or want to deal with. But occasionally I will find a spirit, either someone that I know or some place that just really draws me. And in those cases, I will play messenger. I act as a medium, but not a traditional medium. I don't share my body with them, right. but I will literally tell them what the other wants to hear. Uh, and it can be very innocuous things. Like uh, there was one of the girls I knew when I was in college, she was having activity at her house and she was freaking out. Mm-hmm. So she called and wanted to know what was happening. You know, who was it that was acting up? Who was doing this? Who was doing this? And for whatever reason, I was trying to tap in and figure out who it was, but I wasn't getting words. I wasn't getting names. I wasn't hearing anything. But I could smell vinegar. I could, like, it smelled like Easter egg dying. You know what I mean? Just mm-hmm. when you get all that vinegar out, and it's really potent. And I started talking about the vinegar and the kitchen. And what's happening and, you know, just trying to describe what it was I was getting. And the girl was like, I'm in the kitchen right now. And I'm, she was drinking vinegar of all things, which seemed like a bad plan, but that's what she was doing. And she was doing it out of a glass that was her grandmother's. And her grandmother just passed. And I talked about, you know, the glass and just the stuff that I could feel and see. Mm -hmm. And... It was her grandmother, and her grandmother was trying to talk to her, to try and connect with her, to let her know that she was there. And that was literally what it was. She needed her to know that her grandmother was the one that was currently there, and that's why there was activity in the house. There was no need to worry. It was a completely benign experience, but she needed she needed someone to be able to tell her what was happening so she didn't freak out and continue on, you know, mm-hmm. acting crazy. And it's the same thing when I've had... Um, you know, small children who have talents and, you know, their parents are like, there's something weird going on. The kid is seeing something. We're not sure what it is, but can you figure out what's going on? And in one of those cases, particularly what the child was seeing was a grandparent that they'd never met while they were alive. And the grandparent was trying to be very comforting to the child, but you know, the child had told the parents and the parents were like, Oh, it must be a ghost. You're alone in the house, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it freaked the kid out. So it was trying to, bridge that gap and you know the grandparent is here to see the child and wants to help them and wants to talk to them and you know this is what's going on you need not to tell your children that what they're saying is demons immediately because it might just be grandma you know and just trying to sort of ease out and bridge the gap between people when things like that happen that makes sense Paula some days (laughs) <laughs> she was sitting there going, I'm going to say something. I could see it on her face. And then she just like, it just disappeared. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. It just <laughs> vanished. I've been up for 24 hours. So <laughs> my mind is not That's functioning. Good reason to space. Yeah. <laughs> we have a sick dog on our hands and he has been up most oh. of the night. And we have been up most of the night with him. So. Mm-hmm. So, so far he's so being good. The fur babies are sick. Yeah, we we have fur babies. Yeah, we we love our fur babies. Our fur babies are our children. Mm-hmm. And he's been howling. I mean, he'll actually walk up to the door and just start howling. And the cat's looking at him, going, "Dude, would you just shut up?" <laughs> 
that's what cats look like anyways. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Their personalities crack me up, though. Yeah, she had a, mm-hmm. a cat that was like, you can sit anywhere in her, in her house, but she'll sit right by her feet. Yeah, we saw yes, that picture. Or on my feet. <laughs> or on your feet, yeah. Well, you thought maybe mm-hmm. your feet were cold. Do you have a Roomba? I do not have a Roomba, although I should get one for her. She'd look adorable <laughs> riding around on it. Right? And she does have a shark costume, so it would work. Oh, God. <laughs> I saw somebody actually, this is crazy. They actually painted or, I don't know how exactly how they did it, but they either spray painted it, stained it into the floor, an entire Ouija board into the wood floor. <laughs> I've seen that, yep. And the guy said, God forbid if I have a Roomba, I'll probably summon a demon. Oh, God. <laughs> it's, you know, it's an option. <laughs> so you can picture a cat on the Roomba going back and forth. On an Ouija board that's painted on the floor. Oh, yep. God. Yep. The next thing you know. Mm-hmm. That's you... an asphyxiation you do not want to see. No, but that'd be a, make a funny but movie. I kind of want to know what a cat would summon. Oh, I don't know. It's just whatever the Roomba good does. <laughs> the Roomba's going to go back and forth. <laughs> Lifetime like, I don't know what, what cats want to summon. That just sounds like that would be an amusing situation. Fish. What does a cat want to summon from the other side? Lifetime supply of cat. <laughs> what? Shrimp or something? Yeah. Yeah. Or it would be like, hmm, you know how the dog, what's that movie, Dog versus Cat? Or a cat versus a dog, mm-hmm. or something like that. The cat's mm-hmm. always trying to come up with some type of idea to rule out dogs. Yeah, I could imagine that. It's like, hmm, I'm going to think of a big creature that can step on the dog. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I need minions. Oh, right. there you go. Minions. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. There was a one story that you did at Scarefest that we were going to ask you about, and uh, she wound up talking about something else. What was the one? It was it was before. The, are you talking about the the summons of the the witch that summons the the people in the town, or all the men in the town to work for her or something? Was that the one? Was that one of your stories? Yes. <laughs> I think that is the one. Okay. Okay. What do you want to know about it? Uh, did you ever find? You told me that there was a platform. Or something that showed well, there that there was, was a, a house. Foundation. There was a foundation of actually a house that was there. Was that a tall tale, or was that just something that someone took their imagination and built on it? So at least parts of that are definitely true. Okay. The extent of the actual workings that were going on are up for grabs. Do I think that it was as exaggerated and as crazy as the story has come? No. But do I think that there was probably some workings going on? Absolutely. I think the woman probably was, you know, a wise woman. She was, a, she was you know, a healer. She was someone that was outcast, and she was doing things that people didn't understand. I'll even go so far as to say I believe she probably had poppets made on the side of trees that she was using as effigies. I would believe that. Do I believe she was conjuring all the men from the town to come up and do all of her work for her? No. She may have tried, but I don't think that was actually what was happening. You know what I mean? Like she's yeah. playing a little silver flute. <laughs> exactly right. She's the Pied Piper. Yeah, that's um, it. You know, that is how the story goes, and that is what, at least in some of the accounts, people seem to legitimately believe what's happening. I would. Whatever. You know. Yeah, and the the finishing of the legend of that story. Whatever happened to the woman? Oh, what happened to the woman? Yes. She was, uh, she had made this statement to someone that she would never die by human hands. And uh, apparently people were coming up and were like keeping an eye on her. Some of the stories were like, you know, they were watching her and some were like, we were coming up with a mob to kill her. And uh, so it's your, pick your version if you want, but they said that they found her dancing around a fire and a dark figure pushed her into the fire and she burned but she was pushed by some sort of nefarious, inhuman, shadow personish creature. And that was uh, in eastern Kentucky, that legend is? Yes, up in the hills. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now, are yes, you... way up a holler. Up up the holler. <laughs> yeah, way up a holler. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting trek back that way. 
Hmm. Are you still tracking on future endeavors of some of these legends and lores? Some of them, yes. I mean, I collected these legends over years. I mean, I put this presentation together because essentially I had a bunch of stories that, you know, sort of wove well together. And uh, so I'm always collecting these stories. And if I end up out that way, I will dig further into them. Mm -hmm. But I have other things that I'm, you know, always working on, too. So it's not my main focus, but if I find more, absolutely, I will dig into them. Gotcha. Have you ever got into one story and you just constantly want to dig to find that answer and it just bugs you until <laughs> you can find an answer or find some kind of conclusion that will make sense? I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think everybody's found, you know, those one or two or three stories that when you hear it, you're fascinated by and you constantly have to dig and delve and... I mean, I took that literally to an academic level. I mean, I've been obsessed with Egypt since I was a very small child. Oh, me too. I mean, obsessed. Yep, me too. But I found out when I was in second grade that I was pretty pretty fluent in reading Egyptian hieroglyphs. Me too. I mean, that's not normal. No. And then you start having memories of things that happened then, need to know more and why and what happened then. So if I get obsessed with something, it's generally not a... An urban legend. It's not a tale. It is something that is exceedingly personal. Yeah. Did you uh, read the Book of the Dead? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a transliterated copy here. Yep. I don't like most modern translations of it. Yeah. I. It was just really bizarre and how weird this was. I was. I want to say I was ten, and I walked into mm -hmm. a new bookstore, and I was kind of drawn to the back of the bookstore, and I found this book that was all on Egypt and I'm like oh this is so mm -hmm. cool and I wound up you know getting it and I've looked at it and I looked at the uh, the hieroglyphics and it just like came to me it's like all of a sudden I just saw the A B C D and all that and I'm like holy crap I can actually uh I can read this so I told mm -hmm. my friend about this I was reading this and he goes oh man well there there's an actual book of the dead and I'm like say what he goes, yeah, there is a hmm? book of the dead that's written in hieroglyphics, and I could read it. Mm -hmm. It was the most strangest thing. I mean, that book is crazy, but yeah, I, I'm infatuated with Egypt. I want to go. I want to see the pyramids. I want to see the, the Sphinx. Um, the one town that is, let's see, there's a city there that's gone, I think. Um, there's several cities that are gone, the most famous being Akhetaten. Uh, the one I'm talking about, it has uh, Ra in the front. It has Ra at the front. Yeah, it, ha it has uh, two gods in the front of the columns. It's the one that goes into the hillside. Oh, you're talking about Hathor's temple. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Nefertiti. Uh, it's her temple. It's a temple to Hathor is what it actually is. Um, and she, at that point in time, was ruling as Pharaoh. Um, second queen to do so and uh, yeah beautiful temple and it's supposed to be a funerary temple originally didn't turn out to be but yeah but isn't there uh, ruins of Alexandria there Alexandria okay so Hathor's temple or Hathor's temple is way down the Nile right. uh, Alexandria and the ruins of that are right up on the Mediterranean Sea okay yeah Oh, I want to see the Nile River and go to K and to go to Cairo. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to be like Indiana Jones. Yes. Oh God! Yep, <laughs> I'm gonna wear the fedora, the leather jacket, the whip, the gun. Oh yeah, all we're of not it. hijacking and the plane, hat. and we're not gonna go steal a crystal. No, Good no, Good choice. No, no crystal. <laughs> that was the most dumbest <laughs> Indiana Jones movie I had ever seen in my entire life. With the aliens and the crystal skull. Yes. Oh my god, that was just yeah. he's like aliens? I'm like, oh my god, no, no, no. But there no. were Nazis and aliens. Yeah, I know, but no, no, no. Uh uh. <laughs> it just no. And then of course at the very end the flying saucer flies on and I'm like, seriously? I mean it's bad enough he climbs into a refrigerator after the atom bomb gets dropped. 
and he gets mm-hmm. blown clear across the the field, and he comes out of a freaking refrigerator, and he's okay. No, mm-hmm. no, <laughs> it was just bad. I mean, I'm a huge, huge Indiana Jones fan. I mean, I've seen them all, but when it came to the Crystal Skull, I was like, oh, what did I just watch? <laughs> you can't was... ask those questions. I know, right? Now, I like when they do the parodies of it. <laughs> now, that's some funny stuff. Uh, disaster. Some of them. Yeah, the, what, what was it called? Uh, oh, shoot. It was uh, Disaster disaster Movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little short black guy was playing Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, the little, yeah. He's hilarious. Yeah, that was awesome. But uh, Aliens... I don't really believe in aliens. I mean, I know there's other interdimensional beings out there, or what do they call it? DE, uh, dimensional entities. Uh huh. That's way above our understanding, but supposedly they're there. Mm. What's your take on aliens, Stephanie? (laughs) (laughs) I know what my take is. So, I mean, like, mathematically speaking, there pretty much has to be aliens. I mean, there's, it would be astounding if in the millions of other galaxies there are not, you know, one or two other, at least semi-sentient beings running around. I I firmly believe that there's other things alive out there. Mm-hmm. Do I think that they are all coming here? No. Do I think that they built the pyramids? Absolutely not. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't they had no hand in that. I mean, if you want to argue for, especially like the early alien contact, mm-hmm. about the only argument there that I can even sort of tilt my head to the side and sort of squint and maybe kind of ish see, is if you're saying, you know, aliens inspired the stories of the gods. Okay. I could sort of kind of see that, you know what I mean? Right. Like, if you're going to argue that, that is like the only sort of alien contact that I can sort of kind of see but the idea that we were seated here by aliens or that aliens are coming and visiting us or building pyramids or abducting people to run weird scientific tests on them i you know yeah i like that i can't quite get to but um interdimensional beings yeah that makes sense i mean that i can see yeah things popping in and out it explains a lot especially with some of the inhumans that i've seen over the years Mm -hmm. it would make a lot more sense for them to truly not be from here but from somewhere else entirely oh i know right i've mm-hmm. actually uh got to experience what being in a vortex does to you i did not it makes you puke well yeah i almost got that way um mm-hmm. i woke up in the break room of the slaughterhouse and when i woke up i about fell out of my chair my equilibrium was totally off the room, but this, here's the thing. The room was not spinning. I was. I mean, it felt mm-hmm. like that I got off the tilt-a-whirl, and Paula had to hold me up and walk me down the uh, hallways. I could not stand up on my own. I almost fell into one of their props. I mean, I was just totally out. <laughs> it was just bizarre. Mm-hmm. I've, I've never felt like that before. And after that happened, then we started having some weird activity. Their radios popped on, and we heard a little girl and a dog bark. Hmm. Yeah. So Odd was... combination. Oh, I know. Tell me about it. Well, it's been told that there is something about a little girl. What was mm-hmm. the story about the dog? It was uh, the entity uh, masqueraded as a dog or something like that? Yeah, it's something that has to do with ties with the girl, and it's like a camouflage. It's like a spirit that likes to camouflage itself. As a girl, and then a dog. And a dog. Yeah. And And by spirit, we mean non-human? Yes. We're thinking it is, yes. Yes, we're thinking it is. It's something to draw people in. Oh, God, I have no idea. The bark just sounded like, um... Oh, hell, I can't tell. I'm... I have no idea. It was just like, uh, it was like just your standard, like a dog that's upset, or it knows. You know how you have it a sounds dog- like a German Shepherd. Yeah. A gruff. Uh, yeah. Voice. It's kind of like those deals, you know, if someone walks into your na- you know, in your yard and your dog's outside and it's kind of letting you know that somebody's here. It's kind of like that one of those barks. 
but there's not a story of what the dog looks like. No, no. no. But they have heard growling yeah. there. Oh, they yeah. have heard like people have walked down the halls and they've heard like a, it sounds like a dog that's fixing to come into attack mode and it's a growl. Yep. They have heard. I mean, there's like, and we're not talking about like other paranormal teams. We're talking about just people, people in general visiting mm-hmm. um, the location, even when it's non, when it's a non haunted season. Just going through and checking, you know, electrical lines and stuff like that. If they're moving something, or they're just walking through to make sure, you know, this is okay. You know, during their rounds and checks, they have gotten growled at. People have gotten scratched. People, you know, there's just different things that, you know, randomly happens and there's no investigation. I'd be very interested to see what that dog would look like. I I feel like there's more to that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that would be very telling as to what it actually was, how it would manifest as a dog. Yeah. Well... We were doing an experiment down this hallway, and I was standing in complete darkness, but there was these little, I don't want to say, they looked like garbage bags, but they were flaps. You know, like you would have in like a meat market to keep the cold air out, but they're flaps, and they're kind of heavy-duty plastic? hmm Okay, well, those were actually blowing like somebody is like walking back and forth or pushing them out, and there was no draft there. Mm-hmm. And I'm yeah. standing right next to it. And mm-hmm. that's when I jumped out of there because uh, it was, oh, my God. And our st- our static camera, which is just a regular trail cam, it actually picked up those things blowing and moving outward. And there's there's no wind, there's no draft, there's no nothing in that section. Yeah. So that, I don't know, but there's something down there. Um, the owner said that wasn't there something where they said they saw a person come out of the wall, there was walk pr- across, and disappear into the other wall? Yes, and that was actually said by. Um, put it this way: there has been over forty people that has witnessed, experienced, or been attacked, or something to that effect. There has been some kind of activity to being mild, to being extreme, to where. One person that used to work there ended up having to go to a mental facility for nine months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's gotten pretty bad, but there are just a lot of weird things. But that thing with the little girl and the dog, I was like, well, take the radio and go outside and see if we're picking up a baby monitor or something. Once he went outside, it stopped. Come back inside, it was mm-hmm. on again. Walk down the halls, yeah. it was still on. It's like, what the hell is this thing? And it was trying to lure us to the back where that damn shadow hallway is where those flaps were. But we didn't go that way. We kind of said, mm-mm, we're done. <laughs> and that's when that's the smudgy came in and we all got our butts kicked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it didn't make any sense with me. I'm sitting there, I'm holding the T-pose. They got the stage and they're smudging me. And I'm like, dude, my fingertips are tingling they're burning and i was like okay are we done because i couldn't stand it it was hurting i thought maybe that maybe my muscles were tired and all of a sudden i walked out the door and i looked down on my hands and i'm like holy shit i'm bleeding and then paula looked at me, looked at me and she goes look at your face and i had to like run around to the side to go to the bathroom and sure enough i looked i got clawed in the face there was gouges in my nose like mm-hmm. right on the top, and I, I mean, I was bleeding. My nose was bleeding. I had blood on my fingertips and my fingers. I'm like, oh my! I'd never had that happen. No. Yeah. And then guess what? We're going. What's that been going on there? Oh yeah, there, there's definitely something going on. Those those young witches went ahead and conjured something up. Maybe but one. How long has that been going on? Uh, let's see. Uh, at least for the past seven or eight years. Yeah. And it's been slowly, I mean, it more fir- building. yeah, it's slowly building. It's gotten to the point there has been a team member that has also gone in there and had been viciously clawed down her back to the point it burned blood. Yeah. So uh-huh. it's, it's, it's bad. We don't. <laughs> and we've got, you know, it's gotten to the point that, you know, we, they're wanting to go ahead and do investigations there, and I'm like, well, we need to get in there and have something done first because something's going to drastically happen to one of your, t- 
of future people and it might end up costing to be more drastic than what it is and we don't want you to end up having a liable lawsuit over someone getting severely injured or lost of life. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we're afraid if this thing keeps building and building and building, it can cause something very, very, you know, crucial towards anybody, especially for a child, because children even walk through this building. Yeah, yeah, they do. Well, yeah, but I mean, it lives in a haunted house. It lives there so that it can feed. There's no way it's not going to get stronger. I mean, like the entire situation looks like it's sort of a perfect storm almost. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the thing is, they actually, um, what? I mean, so there's three documented deaths there. That I do know. Yeah. I just found out about the third one just but the, yesterday. The energies actually go into the uh, talent that is there, and it makes them yeah. more believable when they do the haunted yeah. house, because it really scares the teetotal shit out of people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not I like mean, they're acting. They're doing it for real. Inhuman spirits work to begin with. I mean, that's what they do. I... <sighs> I think, like, just hearing about that I find fascinating, the entire story you're telling about this location. Mm -hmm. And I have to think that if this was a coven of, as you're calling them, young witches that conjured this thing, mm -hmm. they had to be lucky as hell. Like, you, the idea that someone without training or without knowledge could go in and summon something like you're talking about mm -hmm. boggles me. That, that or they take did it. work. That... Like, that... You know what I mean? That's the part of it that makes me, like, twitch a little. Yeah, probably you know? pure luck. I mean, probably they got themselves a spell, they followed the directions, and bam, here it is. That yeah, or they did something but, that they weren't knowing that they were doing, though. They might have been trying to do one thing and end up being something else. Yeah, could have been that, too. That almost has to be it, because if you go looking for the spells like you're talking about to summon something like that, you're not going to find it. To legitimately summon something like that, you're not going to find how to do that in your book that some random teen can get their hands on. Right. I mean, I, I think that there might have been something or someone else involved, you know? Well, it almost has to be, or, you know? I don't know. There's a lot of uh, witchcraft stores and satanic stores where you can actually pick up spell books. Hell, you can find them on the internet. Oh, absolutely. You oh, you can, can find and, spells I mean, on I've... websites. That, what do you think the internet is? Well, that's what I'm getting at. But, <laughs> I mean, I've done a fair amount of research into those subjects, and the stuff you're talking about, I mean, it's just not common. Even if you go looking in a book, or most of it's fluff. Mm -hmm. oh. Most of it is very sort of, you know, looking for something that could legitimately do what you're talking about. That is hardcore research. That is getting in there and digging or knowing someone who knew some? you know what I mean? Like, it's that sort of thing. You're not going to be able to find that just by a cursory search by an interested teen. Yeah, that's true. Or, I mean, it could have been somebody that's been doing this for a long time and is fluent in it. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that sounds a lot more likely to me than, you know... Well, I can make this even more interesting on the storyline where this location is is in the middle of a community that is extremely religious yeah. and is extremely Catholic. Yep. I Sounds mean, like home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We it, have this dire location that right is right in the middle that has got these entities and it's tearing people up in the middle of this whole huge Christian Catholic community to where everybody goes to church on Sunday. The cemetery's down the road from it. The Catholic church is just like walking distance from this place. And it's just mm -hmm. like, when this all happened, I'm just like, and we're in a town that is like 300 years old and the church down the road is like 200 years old. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't talk about it at all. It's kind of like hush, hush, taboo. It's, yeah, it's like a taboo situation. <laughs> but it's just, you know... You know, if you bring up anything about, you know, dark entities, devils, demons, or whatever, that's just like, well, we just need to go to the church and pray about it and give you some holy water. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, 
I think that that mindset for people, especially in this area, is very entrenched. I mean, I grew up with that mindset. Mm-hmm. I had people that tell me that I sold my soul to the devil when I was a child. Oh, damn. Because of what I could do. I mean, I grew up with that. So I've always sort of had an affinity for the idea of the witches and the pagans and things like that. So I spent quite a lot of time digging through that and seeing what they actually believe and what people attribute them to believe Mm -hmm. is not at all the truth. You know what I mean? Like the idea of what they are and what they actually are are two completely different things. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel sorry for whoever is being, is getting this pinned on them because I feel quite certain that they probably didn't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But we don't know who did it. All we know is that someone exactly. went in there, and it was done. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, it has been told in a roundabout kind of way. We know where they came from, but we mm-hmm. really can't pinpoint it and and say directly it was them or not. But it is a good possibility because... They were there at this other location. They talked about doing it, and next thing you know, it was done. But you never got a, or they never had confessed to doing it afterwards. Well, yeah, of course not. So, yeah. Interesting. Yep, and this is, and this is what we're going to walk into. And you think you know who it is that's I, haunting it? I don't know who they are per se, but... We were told that there were two witches and and from a particular location, and they were talking about doing this, and the next thing you know, they they went ahead and did it. I don't know who the two witches are, but I do know the location where they were. But what about the thing they conjured? Do you think you know what that is? We were told different things, so we're not too sure. I've been told, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm told three different things. I'm told, A, it was a grim because it attacked Brad and, and tried to suck his life out, which means it's a soul stealer or a soul sucker. <laughs> <laughs> There's another option for that. What the heck? Who, who, okay. Um, or it's a sentinel. Lots of things do that. Or a vanguard. Okay. Or it can be someone severe that they conjured. That it could be a, a a soul that was not meant to be pulled from wherever it was at. Or it could be a minion of Asmodeus because Seven showed up. It could, but pretty much any spirit that is manifesting in the way you're talking about the manifesting mm-hmm. has to steal the energy. And the easy way to do that is to literally go into someone and do it. So any sort of inhuman could literally be stealing a soul like that. So any inhuman can do that? Not not just a grim? Pretty much, yeah. How do you think a ghost manifests? Energy. Yes. The easy way to get that is directly from the source. If you can't scare them, the next thing you do is you touch them. Right. You reach into them and you take it out. Right, but I understand you're taking their energy, but he saw his life flashing before his eyes like he was dying. Yes, this thing has been living in a haunted house. This thing has literally learned fear. Like, I would not, were it me in that situation, I would not focus specifically on it being that. That would just open more options. Mm -hmm. This thing has literally learned to feed from fear. The quickest way to scare someone is literally to flash that. You know what I mean? I gotcha, I gotcha. The only like sa- that. The only yeah. sad thing is, is ever since he, he actually encountered this, he has no apathy. Mm. Mm-hmm. None whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So I've been trying to do some research into that to find out exactly what happened. But when someone has no apathy, like Jared Osborne told us, it's very well possible it was pulled, if you know what I mean. It may have been pulled or it may have shock can do it too. You know what I mean? Damage if you it? can literally scare it into submission almost. Okay. Uh, that is also an option. Yeah, this is all. And it could have been trying to put hooks in. Yeah. To literally ghost over. I mean, that is an option. Yeah, because I've been starting to learn a little bit more about this, and I'm just like, 
Okay, I have to ask this question, and I and uh, I've asked a couple people, and I've got the same answer, and I'm just trying to think. You know, logically, I would think it's impossible, but well, do you think a body can live without a soul? Yes, I've seen it several times. It's terrifying. That a means... soul is the ghost that animates a host. I have been walking through crowds, and as I walk through groups of people, I can feel the people around me. You uh-huh. know, like if you walk past them, I know that they are there. I can feel them. Right. But I've ran across a couple. The first one I ever saw I was at a shopping mall, and I thought the woman was a mannequin. And then she started moving, oh. but there was literally nothing animating her. It was terrifying. Easily one of the most terrifying experiences of my life was realizing that there was not a soul in her body. When you're saying animating, how was the the person moving? Like, um, like a person, like a normal everyday I mean, person. But it's like a it's, like a normal everyday person. Her eyes weren't bright or anything. Like she didn't seem like she had any passion about her. But she dead inside. She was moving. She was exactly gotcha. But she was moving without that animating force inside her. It was terrifying. Hmm. And, of course, when that happens, you can't really get your soul back. You can get something else back, but you can't get your soul back. In theory, if you could find what took it, you could return it, but you wouldn't be able to do that. Somebody else would have to do it for you. Because I found it from a couple people. They say if if your soul gets removed from your body, you're dead. I've heard that, but then I've seen those things, those people that are walking without, without things inside them. I I mean, unless she was literally having an out-of-body experience at the time, mm-hmm. I don't have a better explanation for what I've seen. Hmm. All I got to say, it's, it's, it's scary. And, it's terrifying. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's happening for real. That, that's the thing mm-hmm. I'm trying to get at is, you know, you see this stuff in the movies and, and, and you read about it in books, but holy crap, it's actually happening for real. And I, I just can't wrap my, my mind around it. And it's actually affecting us where well, we're now in, involved in it. I mean, not to sound funny or anything, but I, it's like, I'm Dean <laughs> and Paula's Sam. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, but this is the story. And we're hunters. Oh, God. <laughs> but, but on, Been there, done that. <laughs> but on a side note, have you ever had somebody that you have gone in... A location, and the location would affect everybody that's involved in that location, but the but one person. Yep. You're talking about everything affecting us and not you. Yeah. She has been told. I don't know what this means. Maybe you do, but they're calling her a white lighter. I um, a white lighter is such a vague term and it means so many things to so many people that it it's not precise but she is worlds in a way different from you seeing the two of you in a room together were I a ghost you're the easy target she's not yeah, yeah I never you would even be the one heard to attack not her yeah I mean I have been attacked so many times in so many places and the sad thing is I don't provoke I'm not instigating I'm not doing a damn thing and I've been you kicked. look like dinner <laughs> what do you mean I look like dinner oh my. you look like dinner <clears throat> oh god look at it from the ghost perspective you are animated you are kind of loud sometimes and if we startle you, you're going to give a great reaction. You are literally dinner. You're a buffet on two legs. <laughs> oh well, damn. I guess Brad's dessert. <laughs> I guess Brad's dessert. <laughs> damn. I mean, it makes total sense to me why they would attack you and not her. Not to mention, there are some people that when they start attacking, they're going to show things to. Like, they can't hide as well. Right. So right. it might be that they're going to avoid someone because if they were to attack that one, they would be able to see a way to stop them or they would know what, you know what I mean? They'd get more information out of it that would lead to their downfall quicker. Could I know one 
memorable attack I got. We were at Benton Farms in uh, Walton, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And Joe, Paula, and Eric Connor were up in the attic. And they're doing an EVP session. And he also had his gateway up there. And I was downstairs on the first floor laying down because I was not feeling well. Um, mm -hmm. Like, if you ever come with us on an investigation, you'll, you'll see why I don't feel well. Because I do almost every darn thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Unloading, setting up, getting cameras ready, getting making sure everything got batteries, cards. I mean, I'm... I'm the man. Well, there, it was kind of hot, so I kind of exasperated and exhausted myself from doing so much, plus also not eating when I should have because I had too much crap I had to get done. My mentality is, I got to get this stuff done. It has to be done. Well, mm -hmm. I was laying down. They're up there in the attic, and they've got EVPs, and all of a sudden, Gavin came across the gateway. Me downstairs, I was hit what felt like a heart attack. I clutched my chest because it felt like somebody reached on in and grabbed hold of my heart and was squeezing it. And I'm crawling out of there to go over to base camp. I reach on up to grab the radio and, and, and try to get a hold of Paula. And I'm like, you've got to come down here. And that scared the hell out of me. I mean, it felt like I was actually having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I believe what it was is I was being shown what this particular entity went through. In other words, yeah. it made me an empath, and all of a sudden I started feeling it. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that either. <clears throat> and when we got out of the house, you ever watched that uh, movie uh, Evil Dead with, uh, oh, God, what's his name? The dude with the boomstick, the shotgun, the, the, the chainsaw for uh -huh. a hand. Bruce, uh, Bruce something. Mm -hmm. Bruce Campbell. All right. Yes, I've never seen that one. Oh, okay. Well, when something is ramping up, it goes like that, and then bam, when it hits. Well, mm -hmm. we were outside by my truck. I'm calming down. Everything's fine. And also, we heard that, and it sounded like somebody slammed their fist into the wall or the window of the Benton Farms house. And it was loud. Mm hmm And, of course, so... Uh, after I kind of got better, we walked back toward the, the back door. And then Joe, being Joe, leaned on inside and he shouts, Jesus! <laughs> and next thing you know, we're hearing a female voice inside the house. But the, the, the thing I'm getting at is how either A, I actually was having a real heart attack, or B, that entity was actually showing me what it went through. I still can't wrap yeah. my, my my brain around what exactly happened. I've been told that since that has happened, I have now become an empath. I'm starting to feel things that I never felt before. Yeah. I mean, ghosts will often try and show you how they died. And they, if you let them, they will show you very, you know, aggressively how it is they died. So that would be my first instinct. You haven't had that before. The only thing you had is uh, sensitivity where someone is, you feel sad. sad. I feel sad like the little boy that was crying. I felt his whole, his whole endeavor. Right. And I had to leave the building because it was too emotional. Is that the time we were at Weldon mm -hmm. Manor? Yes. Okay, yeah. That was the first time she actually figured out that she was a sensitive and it was validated by a medium that was watching the meeting through uh, Skype. Skype. And he was in San Jose, Ooh. California. And, cool. And the first thing he said, who is that standing over there by the bookcase? And there was nobody there, but Paula saw it, and it was a little boy, and the whole thing, he was crying, and it, she just became overwhelmed. She started crying and bawling, and she had to leave. Mm -hmm. So it's just, 
amazing how you know they're able to do these things to us. I mean, I guess you can learn more as you keep going on this journey and things keep being shown to us. We we continue to keep learning, but of course, we wind up getting into much darker stuff because believe it or not, after the really after the Benton Farms, all of our investigations has gone dark. We have been dealing with a lot of dark stuff ever since Benton Farms. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know why. Well, for our school, it wasn't really dark. That was just... The principal smacked you. Well, yeah, I got smacked by the principal, but, but there was I a, asked for it, though. But there was also a dark entity that was in that auditorium in that corner. So, yeah, there's, there's, something, there's something there. Something highly intelligent is there because uh, it would not let us leave with any footage. It corrupted all of our footage inside the school. Yep. Uh huh. I, I was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" So. Yep. If they don't want to be shown. They won't be shown. I guess so. Okay. Well, now it's your time to go ahead and shine and let all of the viewers know where they can get a hold of you. If you're going to be doing any events, um, if you have a website, a blog, um. This is your time to go ahead and plug away and uh, let everybody know how they can get in touch with you and follow you. So if you're looking for me on Instagram or on Twitter, my handle is Amarna Marie, which is A-M-A-R-N-A-M-A-R-I-E. And uh, if you just want to get in touch with me, uh, drop me a line on any of those platforms. I'd be more than happy to chat with you. On Facebook, it is just under my name, Stephanie Michelle Bingham. And... Uh, as far as events go, I'm done with events for the year, but we just got an official uh, date that we will be on uh, Paranormal Lockdown in December, so that's coming up very quickly for us here, and uh, yeah, I was just in a book that came out, uh, what is that one called, uh, Paranormal Experiences Volume 4, I think, just came out uh, on Halloween, so oh, wow. a lot of stuff's happening right now. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I am trying to get you into the Silcon event with us. Uh huh. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't got any response on that. Um, they're still uh, getting people in, but I'll, oh, yeah. I'll contact her again. And of course, you know, we do want to come and get inside the Jim Bean Distillery. Well, if we open that up for investigations, your name is on the list. Don't worry. So. And how long is this list? <laughs> Longer than you would think for a show that has not premiered yet. So. Uh, we premiered. You premiered, but the episode of Jim Beam's or of the Paramount Lockdown filmed at Jim Beam has not premiered yet. Oh, um, is that going to be on uh, season three? Because yeah, he's starting in December. Yeah, I know. It was just released yesterday. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I've been watching the Paranormal Lockdown UK. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, that's also going to be shown over here, apparently, along with the episodes of Season 3 that haven't been shown yet. Ah. I'm, I'm just truly amazed watching all the places in the UK. Um, we're hopefully in 2020 going to the UK. We've been invited out there to go out and film we're going to take the show overseas uh go to ireland and all that but paula's over here going i don't want to sit that long on an airplane then take a boat four hours on a freaking plane is long enough I can good stand. lord how long do you think well that, no uh-uh that means we'd be going from new york to uh london and that's the titanic route no thank you Exactly, that's the fun part. Well, the list, the Titanic is going to be coming back in 2020. I'm not buying a ticket <laughs> for that. <laughs> I am not buying a ticket for that. Nope. Uh-uh. I'll fly. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not taking a boat. She hadn't even been on a cruise ship yet. She'd been on a ferry, <laughs> and that took us from uh, the gates at Walt Disney World clear across to the other side of the parking lot. I've been on the ferry in, 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 uh, outside of Corpus Christi. Oh, the one where you held onto the steering wheel for dear life? Oh, my God. That was the most funniest thing. We were going to... Where the heck are we going to? It's that, that little island. I never forgot what the name of that island is. Uh, but, yeah, she... I put the camera on her. It's hilarious. It was the first time I ever was on water before, especially when you're not, like, 
And she was sitting in the truck. And we're on this ferry, and she is holding on to that steering wheel like for dear life. The lady looked at me, and she goes, oh, you guys are going to feel a little bump. I said, don't tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm having a great time. I'm moving this camera all around. I'm like, here we are. We're on the water, and this is cool. And I look at her, and she's like staring straight forward. If she would have took her hands off the steering wheel, they would have been red underneath. It was hilarious. <laughs> I, uh, it was just funny. I mean, I've been on a cruise. I performed on the uh, the cruise that went to the Bahamas, and I did an Elvis show. So I mm. love cruises. Cruises are fun. Yeah. So, but I, on the flip side, I got to get uh, Paula a little gremlin uh, Furby. Gizmo. It, gizmo. Yeah, she's going to get a gizmo. So if you can come to Silicon, you I've got, got a gizmo. Oh, you have a gizmo? Oh, she's going to make I you jealous. I have a gizmo, yes. She's going to make you jealous. <laughs> well, you bring your gizmo. I'll bring my gizmo if you get to come to Silicon next year. Oh, Lord. Sounds good. We'll have a gizmo party. There you go. Well, she'll bring Furbaka, too. He... Yeah, we'll bring him, too. I can. <laughs> Mine don't work anymore. Yeah, Furby, our Furby don't work. Ever since we took him to St. Albans, he don't work anymore. Nope. It doesn't Aww. work. The eyes are, are all the way down. And you can't really tell when it's on. I mean, the damn thing freaks me out. There's no batteries in it, and all of a sudden it comes to life and goes, ah, and then that's it. And yeah. it stops. When things that are electronic start talking without their batteries, I throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's in a box. He's in his corner. He's over he's, there. Hey, he's still sitting in the corner. But yeah, he, he will wake up. I had him inside the blue case. I started hearing something. It was like, rum, rum. I'm like, what the hell is that? Open up the case, and sure enough, the damn Furby's alive, and the batteries are not in it. Yeah, I've had that happen multiple times with electronics, and I throw them away each and every time. <laughs> no, this Furby's cute. We're not going to throw them away. Yeah, we're going to not throw Dingo Ew. away. She's, <laughs> she's in her little box in her corner. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, we have had an en- an entire blast with you tonight. This is cool. We We enjoy talking to you, and of course... We get to hang out with you at Scarefest and talk, and hopefully we can get you over to Silicon and have a table next to us. That'll be fun. It would be. Yeah. I mean, well, you were a table across from us the last time, weren't you? No, you were she was, she was next to us, next right next to, to us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I remember that. We had a whole, a whole bunch of stuff. We were in the corner. That's right. We were in the yeah. corner. Yeah. Yeah. No, normally, we actually take the center floor. We have a, a trailer mm-hmm. and a canopy. Oh, yeah, we go all out. People can walk up there and, yeah. and see the base camp inside the trailer. <laughs> mm-hmm. But anyway, we're going to go on and uh, get off here. And we really enjoyed having you on the show. We'll definitely have you on again. And uh, everybody's got all your information. They know how to find you. I'll, I'll put some links up. Uh, this will be a replay. We'll probably be ready within the next uh, hour or hour and a half. So people that missed the show, they can actually go to speaker.com and pull up the uh, the show from tonight and also listen to the previous ones. And, of course, uh, let me see. i got to pull up my calendar here. Uh, good Lord, my phone's doing some weird stuff. Um December, we're going to actually have, it's going to be the TWC month. So, basically, December, oh, where is December? Okay, here we are, December. December 5th, we're going to have Doogie from the Tennessee Race Chasers. December 12th, we're going to have Scott Porter from the Tennessee Race Chasers. And to end our Season 2 of the Fantasma Journey podcast on December 19th, we're going to be joined by Chris Smith, Brandon Smith, and Mike G of the Tennessee Race Chasers. So we're basically going to end this season with a bang. So I hope everybody has enjoyed the evening tonight with us as well as our special guest, Stephanie. And uh, we'll hope to have everybody join us December 5th when we talk to Doogie from the Tennessee Race Chasers. Hope everybody has themselves a good night. Fantastic.
Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studios. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guest to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. Right now, there are great deals to escape to Europe in spring and summer on direct flights to Ireland with Aer Lingus. Stay put in cool contemporary capital Dublin or head off to any of 20 amazing European cities you've always wanted to visit. Classical chic Rome, Paris, the home of romance, or London, the cutting edge of culture. Deals are for a limited time only, so hurry and book today. Smart says escape to Europe this spring and summer. Smart flies Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Napa know how. Chase Elliott here letting you know that when you spend $25 a Napa this month, you get a free Chase Elliott racing hat. Need a set of brakes? How about a new battery? Both are hat worthy. Replacing an air filter, then adding on wiper blades and headlamps just to break $25? Bucks? That works too. Go get your free Chase Elliott hat today. Quality parts, helpful people, free hats. That's Napa know how. Napa know how. At participating Napa Auto Parts stores, while supplies last. Offer ends 331 19.